Welcome back. Today we are continuing our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written. And last time we finished up 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we looked at a lot of different things in that chapter. Uh, we also saw one of the reasons why a woman is not supposed to be a pastor, according to the Bible. That's a job reserved for a man. And it tells us very clearly at the end of chapter 2 that women are deceived and they need a man to keep them from being deceived. So that God formed Adam first and then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now this ties in to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is all about pastors and deacons. And it's about the qualifications or the different things that God says, this is how a pastor should be, this is how a deacon should be. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at the qualifications. I like to call it the ideal qualifications because it's really hard to be exactly what Paul tells us that a pastor and a, uh, a, and a deacon should be. So these are the ideal qualifications. These are the ideals. This is the way that Paul wants a pastor to be. Now, some aren't this way. <laughs> and I found that there are some pastors that just do not fulfill what they should. And that some of the qualifications here, well, they don't do what they're told to do in the Scripture. So this will be a good study, not just for you that are watching this, that, that may not be a pastor, uh, but also if there's a pastor or a deacon watching these videos, this is for you. And hopefully you'll take this to heart and you'll say, oh, wow, I want to be more like that. I want to follow the Word of God. And that's what I want to do as I read the Scripture. So we're going to go through this today. We're going to look at this. We're going to look at what God says a pastor should be like and what God says a deacon should be like. Now let me go ahead and draw this up here because I need to give you a little bit of back information, a little bit of an introduction here to see what we're talking about. Uh, because there's a lot of confusion in the world, amen? A lot of confusion, unfortunately. And we're not supposed to be confused. The Bible says God is not the, altar, uh, the author of confusion. So here we have the Bible laid out again, as I always do. This is what we call the church age here. That's the time period we're in. We're about right here before the rapture of the church. We're waiting for Jesus' return. Here's the Old Testament law. Now, we've looked at this many times before, but... When Jesus died, he offered and continued to offer to the Jews his salvation. And the nation as a whole rejected their Messiah. So God went to the Gentiles. So the early part of the church, they were under what we called the apostles, or what the Bible calls, doctrine. And they were all doing all these different signs, and they did these wonders, and they were speaking in tongues and doing all these things. And then things changed over here to Paul's doctrine. And so what we have is we have in the church age the early apostles and a certain doctrine that they had for Jews and then God called Paul and we have Paul's doctrine that's more for Gentiles. And of course we had Peter was the main character here after Jesus died. So we got to get a hold of that. Now, what is the church according to the Bible? This is the church. All of this is the church. All of this. Now, some people don't believe that. Some people think the church started with, uh, with Paul. Well, that's quite interesting because Jesus says that he died for a body. So when Jesus died on the cross, his plan for dying, Jesus, the head, he said he's the head of the body, Jesus said that he died to start a body. Well, what is the body? The body is anyone who got the Holy Spirit after he died. They become part of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is the church. So the church is called the body of Christ. And it's made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And there's some people that just can't see that. I don't know why, but the Bible makes it very clear that the body of Christ is a body of believers that believed. And some of them were Jews and some were Gentiles. You can go through, look at our other past sermons and past videos about this as we go through Ephesians and different places. But let me just briefly show you a couple of verses. Let's go to Ephesians. You've got to understand that when we're talking about the church today, what I'm talking about. Because I'll be talking about the pastors and the deacons in the local church. So I want you to get a hold of that and, and see there's a local church, but then there's the body of Christ, which is called the church. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 first, and look at these verses. Ephesians 5, 23 tells us, 
For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So Jesus Christ is the head of the church, the Savior of the body. The body is the church. Now there's some people that don't believe that. They believe the body is different than the church. I don't know why they believe that, because the Bible makes it so clear. Go to Colossians with me, chapter 1 and verse 18. Colossians 1, 18 makes it so clear. Look at uh, verse 17 and then verse 18. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He, of course, is Jesus. And it says, verse 18, And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, comma, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him all things he might have the preeminence. So Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. So the church equals the body. The body of Christ is the church, and the church is the body of Christ. That's very plain to see. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24. It says, Now we rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So Paul says the body of Christ, Jesus' body, is the church. Now Paul says he persecuted the church. So the church existed before Paul. How people can say Paul was the first one in the body of Christ, I find that very strange. Because the body starts with Jesus. It's his body. It's not Paul's body. Paul didn't die for a body. This is Jesus dying to make himself a body. And all who become believers in him. Well, it started out by being Jewish believers into the body, then Gentile believers. And we today are under the doctrines or teachings of Paul. That's why we're doing this Bible study of verse by verse through the epistles of Paul in order when they're written, because Paul's doctrine was a revelation. Revelation. God revealed. Guess who revealed that to him? Jesus revealed to Paul what he was supposed to preach. So, people, I have some people on the internet that love to make videos against me. And they say, Breaker is wrong because he says we're under, G under Paul's ministry and not Jesus' ministry. Uh, we are under Jesus' ministry today in the sense that what Jesus revealed to Paul as our doctrine for today is what we're supposed to follow. So yeah, I follow Jesus. <laughs> I'm not following a man. I'm following Jesus Christ through what Jesus revealed to Paul. That's the doctrine for today. Now, with that stated, clearly this is the church. All saved people after Jesus died, are a part of the church, the body of Christ, whether they be Jew or Gentiles. Now, after that, we have different examples of churches, plural. For example, there are local churches that all saved people can't be in the same place at one time. All throughout the world, there's different groups of believers that get together, and when they come together, they're called a church. The church is all saved people, but a church is believers meeting in a specific place. For example, the church in Corinth was believers in Christ, saved people, part of the church, the body of Christ, meeting together in one place in a town where they lived. The church of Corinth, the church of Ephesus, the church of Thessalonica, etc. And what's interesting, go to Romans chapter 16, is... Today, people have this idea, when you say the word church, they automatically think of a building. But the church isn't a building. The church is people. How has this happened that people, when you say the word church, they automatically think, oh, you have to have this big building for people to come meet in. That didn't happen in the Bible. There were no church buildings. There were no temples. There were no big, huge uh, sanctuary city, huge areas that that they had all these real beautiful gothic columns and everyone in the town says, oh, that's where so-and-so goes to church because that's his church. And they think the building is a church. That's, the, the early Christians never thought of such a thing. The church was always the people. It didn't matter where they met. And most often they didn't even have a place to meet except in the home of another believer. So in Romans chapter 16 and verse 5, look at this. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So someone is holding a church service in their home. Now how can it be a church? Nowadays people think the church is a building. So is the house a building? <laughs> Did they have a little steeple on top of the little house that they, they met in? No, it was their home. And they invited other believers to come in to their home. And they, they preached, they studied the Bible, they read and studied together. So there's no church buildings in the Bible. 
true Christians had to meet underground in homes because during the time of Paul, um, the, the uh, Roman emperor hated Christianity. He would literally kill Christians. So Christians had to be low-key and had to go around and talk and, and uh, watch out for, the, for the, the, the soldiers because soldiers would take Christians and put them into the uh, Colosseum and throw them to the lions, burn them at the stake, do all sorts of horrible things to Christians. So there were no church buildings. The church is the people, not a building. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. Here's another example. Colossians 4.15, and above, uh, let's see, 4.15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. So early believers would meet together in homes, and they made a local church. That's what they called their, their church. They, they went together to hold church services. But they never looked at the building as their church. They looked at themselves, the people, as we are a church in this area. Let me show you one more example of that. Philemon. Philemon. And in Philemon chapter... Well, there's only one chapter. So Philemon verse 2, I believe it is. Is it verse 2? Yes. And to our beloved Apaya and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in his house. So the church was the people that were meeting together in a specific place. And so that ties us back into... 1 Timothy chapter 3. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, the first verse says, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And then look down in verse 8. Likewise must the deacons. So the chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is going to talk to us about pastors and deacons. Now pastors and deacons of what? Of a local assembly, we could call it or a local church, which, by the way, is in a house. You know, a lot of people today think, oh, you can't have a church unless you have a building. You can meet in your home, and you're holding church services. You are a local church in your house holding services, meeting together. And so that's what we have to get a hold of. So people today, they think that a church is a building, but that's not so. The church is the people, not the building. In matter of fact, in days gone by, in ages past, they, they, they wouldn't call the, the building the church. They would have different names, like the chapel, or they'd call it the meeting house, or the congregation house, or the sanctuary. I don't know if it was the Catholic church or who it was, but somehow it seeped into Christianity that a building should be called a church. And that's not right, because the church is the people, not the building. So we're going to see that a little bit later in this chapter as well. But what he's talking about here, the Apostle Paul, is he's telling them about choosing pastors and deacons for the little groups that they meet in a house. So there could be ten people meeting in a house. There could be a hundred people. You never know. It was always different. Sometimes they'd get to be so many that they'd have to split up and go to another house. And so there's all these little local churches all around. And Paul says each one of these little assemblies needs somebody that's a pastor. And they need some deacons as well. And what we have here... When we look at the word pastor, in the Bible, the Bible also calls pastors bishops, and the Bible also calls them elders. So, anytime you see elder or bishop, that's talking about a pastor of a local assembly or a local group in a certain area of believers meeting together. And then you have pastors and deacons. Now, we all know what a pastor is. I mean, pretty much everybody, even lost people, know that the person that's in charge of the, the meeting and who does the preaching is called a pastor. But what about deacons? What are deacons? Where do deacons come from? Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 6. Let me show you if I can. Here's the early church, which is mostly made up of Jews at this time, if not all Jews at this time. And here we have something taking place. Now remember, the head honcho during this time, the early part of the church, was old Peter. So here Peter is, and Peter has a bunch of believers all meeting together in a group. And something happens, and people are coming to Peter and saying, Peter, man, uh, we need you to do this. We need you to do this. We need... And Peter's like, oh, I'm so busy. How am I going to get all this done? And so he says, you know what we need to do? We need to, we need to elect some people in the church to help the pastor. Because the pastor can't do everything. Amen? 
And so we see them appointing what we'll call later deacons. So let's go to Acts chapter 6, and what I'll do, I'll read verse 1 through 5, and we'll see the origin of where deacons come from. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So you had some Grecians. And some people say, well, these were Hebrew believers that had adopted more Greek customs, so they spoke Greek, and yet they were Jews. Others say, well, these were Greeks that were saved, that were part of the church. If they weren't Jews, and they were Greeks, then they were Jewish proselytes that were in Jerusalem that had then accepted uh, the message, the apostles' doctrine. But either way, whoever they were, they were together, and they began to murmur and saying, well, you know, we have widows that need to be taken care of by the church. Now, if you remember what happened in the early part of the church, they sold everything they had, and they all lived together in a commune, and then everyone would distribute to each other as they had need. I believe that's in chapter 5. So there was a group that rose up and says, Man, it's not fair. We have some of our group that aren't being taken care of. Now Peter's in charge of these people. How many are there? Well, you read back in the early part of Acts, there was 3,000 people that had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So that's a lot of folks for one man to be a pastor over. 3,000? That's a lot. So here's what they did. Verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, Is it not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables? Here you have Peter speaking and some of the early apostles. And they're saying, look, we shouldn't leave the word of God and go serve tables. Our job is a spiritual job. We read, we study the word of God so we can prepare a message to preach every week that we come together, that we meet. So the pastor's job is to study, study, study the Word of God and then bring a message from the Word of God to the people and feed them. It's like he's feeding them, but he's feeding them spiritually the Word of God. But the business that was going on in the church was there were other people that need to be fed physically. And so Peter's like, well, I shouldn't have to feed them twice. I shouldn't have to feed them God's Word and then turn over here and work my butt off feeding them physically. I'm trying to study the Word so I can feed them God's Word. So what they said was, We should not leave the word of God and serve tables. Verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may, may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procor Prochorus, and Nicor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So here is a group of men, and it even gives us the name, that I would say were the first deacons of the local church in Jerusalem. And the deacon's job was more to work with the physical needs of the people and take care of the physical parts of the church. So if someone came and said, you know, uh, we're hurting, we need some food, or, you know, uh, we're having a bad month, we need some help, or something to that effect, or maybe they just said, hey, we, we got a sick loved one, we need someone to come visit and pray for them. That was more to be the deacon's job. Although the deacons also could preach if they needed to. They needed to be men full of the Holy Ghost, but learned in the truth. The pastor's job was to be more spiritual, he was supposed to spend time studying the Word of God and reading the Scriptures and being full of the Holy Spirit and preaching a Spirit-filled message to the people to feed the people with the Word of God. So you see the two offices of the local church is a pastor and a deacon. Now, with that stated, <laughs> I guess we can go back to 1 Timothy and then we get an idea of what Paul is saying. Paul has been traveling all over and he's starting local churches everywhere he goes. And Timothy was someone that he trained to do what he's doing. And then he's telling Timothy here, now this is what you do when you go and you start a church of a group of believers in one place. This is what you do when you set up pastors and deacons. Now how many deacons does a church need? I don't know. One guy said, for every 100 people that meet together, you should have one deacon. I don't know. Uh, maybe so. I don't know. I, I've never figured out the ratio of deacons to pastors, <laughs> if there is such a thing. But uh, I guess just as many as are needed. Amen. Um, that's what it's, it's up to. But what is a deacon? Okay, so let's look at this. First of all, chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. 
verse 1 through 7 are what we call the qualifications of a pastor. So I'm going to write this over here, what a pastor should be. And then we're going to look at the qualifications of a deacon and what a deacon should be. And they're pretty much the same, really. But this is what a deacon should be like, and this is what a pastor should be like. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> there are a lot of pastors that love to run to this passage and attack other pastors. And they say, this is what a pastor should be, and then they see another pastor they don't like and say, well, I don't see you. You're not like this, so you're not a pastor. Who are you to judge? I mean, sorry, but if the guy's doing the work of the Lord, the last thing he needs is another guy who's a Christian to attack him. He needs to get along, to edify one another, help one another. If I come across a pastor that's doing something wrong, I don't attack him. I say, brother, you know, I'm really concerned for you, and I really think you're doing something that's not scriptural, and I'd, I'd, I'd just like to encourage you to, to fix this thing and do right. He gets mad at me, fine. At least I know with a good conscience that I tried to help and edify the brother, not attack him and put him down. But there are a lot of ministers that love to run to this passage, and it's funny to me, they love to underline one part in verse 2. And that seems like it's the only thing they ever read of this whole passage. It says, the husband of one wife. I've met so many ministers that they just love to run around and point the finger and say, oh, so-and-so's been double married, and a double married preacher can't be a pastor. And I say, what? What? Yeah, he can't. What if his wife died? <laughs> if a man's a pastor and his wife dies, he can remarry another woman and still be a pastor because he's still the husband of one wife. The other one died. He's only got one. Now, I'm not going to get into divorced pastors. I really don't think it's a good thing for a man to be a pastor if he has been divorced before. But then again, what if he was before, before he was saved? What if he was divorced before he was saved? Well, then, isn't that under the blood of Jesus? So a guy was divorced before he saved, he gets saved... And then he's got one wife. Well, yeah, he can be a pastor. Now, what if that wife dies? Well, he remarries, he can still be a pastor. But what if he's divorced as a pastor? Now, I'm not going to get into that. I have some videos about that. I think God has grace. I think the blood of Jesus forgives all sins. But I also understand that many times a man who is a pastor who has been divorced while he was a Christian, a lot of times that can be a poor testimony and it can affect the church. So we're going to look at that when we get into this. So I'm not attacking double married preachers, I mean. I'm saying that the blood of Jesus forgives all sins. But there are a lot of ministers out there that any time they hear of a man that's been married more than once, they automatically say, well, you're disqualified. You don't have a qualification of a pastor. You're disqualified. You've been married more than once. And I think that's just plumb awful. Because there are so many other things here that are the qualifications of a pastor. <laughs> And I could point to any one of them and say, well, you're disqualified because it says here uh, to be of good behavior and you're not behaving. And it says here, uh, not a brawler. And all you do is brawl with other people and rah, 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 and attack and fight. And, uh, you know, it's so easy to point the finger at others. But always remember, when you're pointing a finger at someone, there's three fingers pointing right back at you. Amen? Be very careful before you point the finger at someone. Now, somebody wrote me an email the other day and said, well, Brother Breaker, have you, have, when did you get divorced? <laughs> I was like, when did I? Huh? I have never been divorced. I thought that was funny. It's like, I guess people are lying like they always do and must have said some lie that I've been uh, divorced before. I have uh, never been married except to my wife. Thank God. Now, before I was married, I had four different fiancés, and I was jilted by each one of them. And looking back on that, I say, thank you, Jesus. Amen? I fell in love with someone that I thought was a Christian. They told me they were Christians, and probably they were, but they didn't believe the same way I did. They believed in divorce, or they believed in something different. And I thank God that we never got married, because we would have had a lot of problems in our marriage because they didn't believe like I do. And so God showed me what I did not need as a wife four different times. And so then I said, well, Lord, it's up to you. And I prayed and trusted to God, and God sent me the right one. And boy, I had to wait a long time. I don't, I don't think I was married until I was 31 years old. So I was a 31-year-old man when I got married. I wish I could have gotten married at 18. I mean, marriage is wonderful. Kids are great. But God spared me from some problems that I could have had. And so I try to help people that want to get married. I've written a book. You can find it online. 
It's called What the Bible Says About Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage. It's all about what the Bible says, not my opinion. It's what God says about it. God hates divorce, and divorce is a bad thing. So it has helped a lot of people. All those people that have read it, they said, man, that really helped us. So maybe that will be a help to you as well. So I have never been divorced, and by God's grace, I never will be. I do not believe in divorce. It breaks the type of Christ in the church. Christ, as we read earlier, one of the verses we read, Jesus Christ is the head of the church as the man is the head of his wife. So the wife is the type of the church, and the man is the type of Christ. Well, Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When you get saved, you can't lose it. So when you get married, you're not supposed to divorce because that breaks the type of eternal security of salvation of the believer. So divorce is never an option, nor should it be. But I went into all that to say this. Many ministers want to look at like this at other pastors. And they're only looking for one thing. Is that man divorced? Why aren't they looking at the list of all the other things? <laughs> I've never understood why that was the one thing they always want to look and see if you're qualified or not. But they'll never look at any of the others. So let's look at that today. Let's look at the so-called qualifications of a pastor. So what it says here, we'll begin reading there, and I'll just go ahead and read the whole passage and write down all of these things that we would call the, the qualifications of a pastor. It starts out, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Alright? He must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Husband of one wife. And I believe that what that meant was he can't have two or three wives. In those days, there was a lot of polygamy. And there were some people, before they got saved, they had three, four, five wives in the house. And I think that's what it's talking about, the husband of one wife. He must be only married to one woman, not two or three. But people today think, no, what that means, the husband of one wife, means he's only been married one time. Well, let's say a guy was divorced and remarried. You go to his house, how many women are in his house? One. The other woman ran off. So, a lot of people, they read the Bible, they read their own interpretation into it just to condemn others. And I try not to do that. Now, it says they're the husband of one wife. The next thing was vigilant. He must be vigilant. He must be sober. He must be good behavior. Oh boy, that's a good one. I've met a lot of pastors that don't behave. Um, he must be given to hospitality hospitable. That's a good one. A pastor must also be apt to teach. So he must know the Bible in order to teach the Bible. Not given to wine. So not given to wine. I wonder if I'll get all these to fit up here. No striker. Now I'll explain all these here in a minute, what, it, what it's talking about. It says, uh, not greedy. So he shouldn't be a greedy person. Greedy of filthy liquor. He must be patient. Now I'm running out of room here. Yep, that's the bottom one. He must be patient. Not a brawler. And I'm running out of room, so I guess I'll have to start back up here on the top. Not a brawler. Also, not covetous. What's next? He shouldn't covet and want something that doesn't belong to him. He must rule his house. He must know how to rule his house with all gravity, it says. It says in verse 6, not a novice. Which, of course, would be like a beginner. Someone that doesn't know anything and you just let him take over. That, that's not going to work. He needs to know something. Um... He must have good report. Okay, so there we go. There's the list. Unfortunately, it didn't all fit here, so I had to start back up at the top. But let's read this, and let's look at what the Bible says about a pastor. This is a true saying, verse 1, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now notice what it calls it, the office. So a pastor takes the office in the church as the one who is the bishop or the pastor, and it's an office. And it's an office that a man can desire. People have called me all the time, a young men, and say, well, I, I'm thinking that, that I might want to be a pastor someday. Is it wrong to want to be? 
Well, not according to this verse. You can desire to be a preacher or a pastor someday. It's a good work. It's a good thing to want to minister to others. By the way, that's what a pastor is supposed to do. He's supposed to minister. <laughs> He's supposed to minister. Now, as we saw here earlier, what he ministers in, the pastor, is to focus on the spiritual things and to teach people. So it's all about being apt to teach. It's spiritual. The deacon's job was more of the carnal or the physical, helping the, the carnal needs of people. But it's spiritual is the job of the pastor. So remember that. Now, so a pastor desires the off of office of a bishop. He desires the good work. So it's not wrong to want to be a pastor. But as a pastor who has pastored before over close to my house up the road, there's Scarson Point Baptist Church. I pastored there for close to six months while I was in Bible school. In Honduras, I worked as a pastor of several churches that I helped to start. And here now, a lot of people call me on the phone and say, Pastor Breaker, and I'm just like, well, call me Brother Breaker. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a local church. We meet together on the cloud. That's why this is called the Cloud Church. But if you want to call me Pastor, that's fine. And um, I just rather Brother Breaker, that's fine to me. But a pastor, then, is someone who has an office in the local church, the place where they believe. Now, the reason I started the, 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 the cloud church, by the way, is because we live in the last days. Paul said in the last days, perilous times shall come. All over this country and all over the world, I've come across people that are believers in Christ that cannot find a good local church. There are just not any good churches that preach the truth anywhere close to them. All over Europe, people contact me all the time from Europe and say, look, there's no Bible-believing churches here. Not a one. I'm saved, and I feel like I'm the only person in this whole state or this whole country that knows Jesus. So I said, well, Lord, what should I do? And the Lord said, thecloudchurch.org. Go that way. Reach people that way. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. All right, so the cloud is where everything on the Internet goes. So I make a video to anybody in the world to teach have to teach, to help them study the Bible. And they can come there, and they can watch it. There's two of us together in front of us, a computer screen, but we're together, and we're studying the Word of God. So to me, it's all about teaching and preaching the Word of God and reaching everyone I can. Well, I found the best way to reach people is not just me getting in a plane and going to one little country and one little community and one little city and preaching. I only reach that many people. Cast your bread upon the waters, the Bible says, and return it to you after many days. So I take the internet and take my messages out, and it reaches the whole world. It's incredible how many people in so many different countries watch these videos. And part of the desire that I have of the cloudchurch.org is to help start local churches. I have people, a guy in Kenya, um, somebody down in Mexico, uh, People in other places all over the world say that they meet together in houses, which is interesting, and they watch my videos on, on YouTube, and that's them starting a local church in their own home, just the way the Bible did. I think that's incredible. And so I say, well, pray about it. Try to find somebody that's learned in the Word and, and vote for him to be the pastor, and then you guys can start your own local church that way. So I want to do things biblically, but I want people to get saved. We are very, very close to the rapture, and the most important thing to me is to get the Word of God out, get the gospel out so people can accept it and be saved, and then teach people to grow as a Christian. And so that's what I'm focusing on. But the ideal situation is that you would have a place where you live that you can get together with other believers, a local church. And in that situation, you would choose a pastor. Now, what is the pastor to be like? Well, verse 2. 1 Timothy 3, 2, a bishop, which is the pastor, then must be blameless. Now, what does it mean, blameless? It means that he's living such a holy life as a Christian and doing right because he desires a good work. So what is a pastor supposed to do? He's supposed to do good. He's supposed to do good works. He's doing so good that no one could ever come up and accuse him of something and blame him and say, well, you're to blame because you did this. He's supposed to live above reproach so that he doesn't do anything that someone could blame him for. That's wrong. So he should be blameless. Now, I've met a lot of pastors that aren't blameless. <laughs> if, you wanna, if you wanna talk about disqualification for the ministry, I've met a lot of pastors that they were blamed for a lot of things that they were guilty of. And yet they still say, but I'm the pastor here and I'm gonna stay. Okay, God can forgive sins, I can forgive too. But that's not excuse to go do them, amen? 
And if you do live an evil life as a pastor, maybe you should step down and let somebody else take over who's going to do a better job than you. Just something to think about. The bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now there it is, the husband of one wife. Now, I call these the ideal qualifications. Because sometimes it's, it's almost impossible to have all of these. When I went as a missionary to Honduras, I was 20-something years old. And I was unmarried. And I went and I started churches in Honduras and I was a pastor. Well, I was not a very good pastor, I guess, because I wasn't the husband of one wife, because I didn't have a wife. Now, I was blameless. I didn't sleep around and go find another girl and do bad things with girls. I kept myself pure. What did I do? I followed the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was not married. He went around and he preached and he did what was right. He started churches. So, obviously, when it says the husband of one wife, that's the ideal. That's the ideal qualification. That, that's the best is that if he's the husband of one wife. But if he's not married, that doesn't mean he can't go and be a missionary and start churches because Paul said, be followers of me. Well, I literally followed Paul. I went as a single man and preached the gospel in another country and started churches just like Paul. So these are the ideal qualifications. The ideal qualifications are that you're the husband of one wife. Now, I'm not going to go into that divorce anymore. I think I talked enough about that. But there are a lot of uh, ministers that that's like the only one that they care about whether or not a man's been married more than once. And they call it a double married preacher. And they say a double married preacher shouldn't be a pastor. Why do they say that? Because of verse 4. And we'll get to that in a minute and I'll comment on that. But it says the husband of one wife. Vigilant. Okay, that means always looking, always seeing. Not with his head in the sand. He's always studying, always looking around. Always uh, looking at the signs of the times, if you will. Always realizing how to rightly divide and to know where we are in our time and, and what's going on. It says, vigilant, sober. All right, so he shouldn't be a drunk. He shouldn't walk around drunk all the time. He should be of good behavior. All right, so he should behave. He should be someone that behaves, that has a good testimony. And then it says, given to hospitality. Now, there we go. I've met some pastors that I could say, you know what? <laughs> You're a horrible pastor, and you are not hospitable. I, I preach in over 200 churches, and before you go as a missionary to a foreign field, you do what's called deputation. And deputation is where you call churches up and you ask them for an opportunity to preach in their church. And when you go there, you preach, and then you leave. And pastors are supposed to be hospitable. I can't tell you how many times I would show up with a pastor, and, and I'm a young man, I just want a fellowship, I want to ask this pastor questions, I want to get to know him, I want to have sweet, sweet fellowship, and you get to the church, and he goes, oh, you're here, good, okay, you're going to go preach, all right, um, yeah, hurry, and you get there, and you preach, he goes, okay, here's your offering, God bless you, have a nice day, and it's just like, well, that was very hospitable. Other times you get there the day before and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm here tonight and I'll be preaching for you tomorrow. And he says, well, your hotel is so-and-so. Go there. See ya. And it's like, that always bothered me. Yeah, it's nice that they put you up in a hotel. I mean, but I want fellowship with other Christians. You know, Paul talks a lot about having fellowship with others. I want to go to a church and I want the pastor to say, come on over to my house and let's sit down and talk. Let's get to know one another. Talk. Some of the sweetest fellowship I've ever had in my life is going to churches and staying at the pastor's house. And we just talk all late into the night about God and the Bible. But I've met a lot of pastors that weren't hospitable. They're just, there's your hotel room, go stay over there. <laughs> so that's one of the qualifications. I mean, if people are going to point the finger and say, he's not the husband of one wife, he can't... Then I'm going to point the finger, hey, but what about hospitable? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of pastors that aren't very hospitable. That's something to think about. One time I went to see a pastor that I heard good things about, and I've wanted to meet for a long time. We drove a long ways to see that pastor, and we went to his church. And we went up to him afterwards, and I said, Pastor, man, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. I'm missionary Robert Breaker, and it's just a pleasure to be here in your church, and it's just so good to meet you. And he goes, nice to meet you too. Have a nice day, and walked out. <laughs> and then I was like, Okay. I guess he wasn't very hospitable. I mean, he could have at least talked for a little bit. Well, we walk outside, and I'm just like with my wife going, Man, I really wanted to talk to that guy. He, he really loves the Lord. He's a smart man. He knows a lot. I was hoping to buy him some, some lunch or something. And we go outside the church. His car is parked right next to our car. 
And so I walk out and I say, hey, pastor, hey. And he goes, hi, got his car and drove off. <laughs> I was about to invite the guy out to eat because I wanted to fellowship with him. And as he's pulling out with his window down, he goes, honey, do we have plans for dinner? And she goes, no. Where are we going now? Are we going to have to eat? And she goes, whatever you want to do. And that pastor looked at me and he goes, well, have a nice day. And he just drove off. So he had no plans whatsoever. He just didn't want to deal with it. I guess he wanted to go home and take a nap. I don't know. All I know is I've seen a lot of pastors that aren't very hospitable. I crave fellowship. I like fellowshipping with other pastors, especially when they're good and they love the Lord. So I'll let that go. Amen. I'm not bitter. I'm just saying it as a young man that's going around preaching in all these churches, traveling all over America, I really looked up to the older men and really wanted some advice and knowledge, for, and, and they were very unhospitable. It was just like, yeah, have a nice day. Can't wait for you to leave type thing. So that's really sad. So if you're a pastor and you're watching this, please be more hospitable to others. They won't forget it if you're not. Anyway, it says there um, in verse 2, given to hospitality. Verse 3, apt to teach. Now verse 3, not given to wine. It says no striker. What is a striker? Someone that goes like this, boom, and just hits you for no reason. Or someone that goes... And just slaps you for no reason. And I think of it like this. A, a guy who's a pastor that comes up and says, Well, you, 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 you. And you say something and he just goes, Slap. <laughs> That's a striker. Why would he slap you? <laughs> it's because a short-tempered person does that. Somebody has a short temper, they hear something they don't like, they just go, Slap. No, that's, that's not the way you're supposed to be. So Paul's saying, don't be a striker. Don't, for no reason, just slap people upside the head or punch them in the face. And uh, sadly, I've been to... Uh, one or two missions conferences in my life where I came across missionaries that had started churches in foreign countries and they were back in America and I said something to them that uh, they didn't like and it was the truth and they didn't want to hear the truth and uh, two or three times they almost hauled off and slugged me in the face and I said what are you going to do brother be a striker and punch me I said you know this isn't right and that this is the truth are you going to punch me right now and they were like this and then they said oh and walked away <laughs> so I hate to admit that, but that, that's why it's so important to study the Bible, amen? We need to make sure that if we're a pastor or a missionary or an evangelist, or, that we do follow what Paul said we should be, amen? I've never hauled off and hit somebody in the face. I, I, I might have wanted to once or twice, but I knew that wasn't the right thing to do, so I didn't do it. So it says, not a, a no striker, no greedy of filthy lucre. All right, that's something that a pastor shouldn't be, that he loves money more than God. And yet there are some pastors like that. But they should be patient, it says, not a brawler. Now, what is a brawler? A striker is someone that just hits you. But a brawler is someone that, that will go all out and just fight you. They don't stop hitting. They just keep going and going and going. And so we shouldn't be like that. Now, luckily, I've never met a pastor like that that, that beat the snot out of somebody and didn't quit, and I hope I never do. <laughs> And then it says, not covetous. Now, that's a good thing. Don't be covetous, which means wanting something that does not belong to you. A lot of pastors are like that. Verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, this, is, this ties back to the husband of one wife. If a man is a Christian and he's a pastor, ideally, he should only be married once. His wife dies... Not a sin to remarry a Christian woman. But if a man's been divorced after he's saved and he's a pastor that's been divorced, I've seen it firsthand. People that sit under that say, well, if he's divorced, I can be too. And they go get divorced. So it's a bad testimony for a man who's been divorced to be a pastor. It really is. Now, if it wasn't his fault, there's nothing he can do about it. Amen? We live in a day and age of easy divorcism. Where it's sixty nine dollars, the woman can run off in the middle of the night, and the guy's sitting there going, "Oh, where's my wife and kids?" It happened to my dad. I mean, my dad was here one day. The next day, he comes home to an empty house, ran off and left him. So, those things happen. We live in a day like that, and it's sad. But a man is supposed to rule his own house. Why? Verse five: For if man know not how to rule his own house. How should he take care of the church of God? Good question. How can a man be a good pastor if he's not a good husband and a good father? So that's something we should pay attention to. Sometimes, not always, 
a reason a man's divorced is because he's not a good man. And his wife just says, I can't take it anymore, and she leaves. Now, she shouldn't. The Bible commands a woman never to depart from her husband. A woman that divorces her husband does wrong, and she sins against God. And she should not do that. But, if a man is divorced, it might be, I'm not saying always, but it might be a reflection on him that the reason he's divorced is because he did not rule his own house well. And if he can't rule his own home, how could you expect him to be the pastor of a church ruling in that area and rule well? If a man runs his house wrong, he will run the church wrong. It's that simple. And that's just the way it is. So, if the Bible says, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he care for the church of God? Now, I hate to give you this illustration, but I might as well. I was in Wyoming one time preaching. I preached at a church in Wyoming. And when I got done, I went over to the pastor's house, and we sat down, and the pastor told me, he says, well, Brother Breaker, he said, seven women came up to me after, as angry as they could be, and told me that, that they were mad at what you preached. Now, I don't even remember what I preached on. <laughs> but they were angry. And the pastor says, I was going to let you preach tonight, but I'm not going to do it. Unless you want to get up and apologize in the pulpit to these women for offending them. Otherwise, um, and, and even then, I'm not going to let you preach, but you can apologize if you want. And I looked at that brother and I go, what are you talking about? What did I say? And he told me what I said that offended them. And I, and I scratched my head and I said, well, all I did was preach the Bible, right? Do you agree that what I said was Bible? And he shook his head, yeah, yeah. Okay, so why should I apologize for what God says? Number one. I said, number two, and, and maybe I was mean in saying this, <laughs> but I said, ain't no Jezebel hag ever going to tell this preacher what he can and can't say from the pulpit when I preach in the Word of God. I said, if those wicked Jezebel women are mad, it's because they're mad at God and what he says, not at me. I said, Pastor, you need to set them straight. Well, the man says, no, I'm scared of them. I'm not going to do that. And, and Basically, I was the bad guy, <laughs> and this pastor was trying to keep this church together with these women butting heads with them the whole time. And while we're there talking, this pastor says, yeah, and I have a son, and he's not doing right, so I'm sending him off to this Christian ranch to get right, and he's, you know, rebellious, and he's doing this. And all of a sudden, this scripture came back to my mind. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God? <laughs> and then it, just, it was just clear to me, oh. This man can't rule his own house, got a rebellious teenager kid, had to send him away to a camp to get right. Reflection on him that he's not what he should be in the house. That's why the church is like that, where seven Jezebel wicked women can come up to him and say, we don't like that preaching that he preached. Well, it should have been something that the preacher preached against. So do you see why a person, a better pastor is a pastor who can can rule their house well. Because if they do well in their house, training their children upright and teaching them correctly, then they'll also do the same in the church. Now, I don't know if I should have told that story, but it makes a good illustration of someone shouldn't be a pastor who doesn't rule their house well. Because it reflects on how they'll rule the church. <sighs> Let me continue. <laughs> Verse 6, not a novice. Not a novice. Now, what is a novice? A novice is someone with no skill. So a novice is someone who's not skilled and learned in the Word. So a novice is like taking a young person and putting them in charge of a church. Well, they don't know what to preach. They don't have any experience. They, don't, they haven't been taught. Well, what do you, so it needs to be someone that's learned and, and knows the Scriptures. Usually an older man should be the pastor. Not a novice. Lest he be lifted up with pride, he should fall into the condemnation of the devil. It's so easy for a person who's a pastor, if he's a young man, to get prideful. And I fought that, and I still fight that. The last thing in the world that I want to be is prideful. And go around and say, hey, look at me, how great I am. I'm, I'm horrible. I don't even like myself. I don't even like the term self-esteem. People start saying, you ought to have self-esteem. You ought to like yourself. I go, that's how I feel about myself. I don't, I don't want to like myself because then I'll be puffed up with pride and think I'm something special. I'm not something special. I'm nothing. Jesus is everything. Amen. So it says, not a lot, novice, lest you be lifted up with pride. 
he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Now, who are them that were without? Lost people. So a pastor should be with a good report among the Christians and a good report out in the lost world. When he goes out in the world, he buys stuff from the, from the market. When he goes out and does this, the lost people should look at him and say, you know that guy, he, he, he says he's a Christian, but we can't find any fault in him. He's doing right, it, it seems to us. So he should have a good testimony within the church and without lost people. And then it says here, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. What does that mean? That means a, a pastor could fall into sin by doing certain things outside of the church, but then in church doing something different. I, I heard an evangelist one time talk about this pastor. He said he went to this church, and the church members came up to him and said, Brother Evangelist, our pastor's horrible. He's wicked. He's evil. He's sinning. He's doing things that he shouldn't, and he's cheating on his wife. And the evangelist was like, uh, how did I get in this situation? You know, you don't ever want to get in a situation like that when they're coming and telling you how bad. But they said, Brother Evangelist, come with me tonight, and I'll show it to you. And some people in the church took that evangelist, and they went to a bar that evening. And the evangelist is going, I don't want to go in a bar. And they go, you trust us. And he did. They, they all went into the bar. I don't know if it was deacons. I don't know what it was, but several men in the church took this evangelist in. And there sitting at the bar was the pastor of the church with a woman on this side and a woman on this side. And he turned around and he said, Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And he ran off into the bathroom. Well, the, the brothers from the church and the evangelist followed him into the bathroom. Well, that pastor sitting in a stall all by himself, feeling bad because he got caught. These two women come into the men's bathroom and they're standing there going, what is this? What's going on? And they're saying, honey, this is a pastor of a church. I don't know what he said to you, but he's a happily married man and he's out in a bar right now with two women. This is wrong. And those two women go, that can't be. He told us he was a Texas Ranger. <laughs> he's out there lying to women in a bar to pick them up. And so... That went on for a little while, and they talked to that pastor and said, you know, pastor, this isn't right, what you're doing, and you know that. And uh, I think that was probably Saturday night. The Sunday morning, this evangelist told me that the pastor got up in the pulpit and says, well, I feel that the Lord is telling us to move on, so my wife and I, we're going to leave this job as pastor. We're going to move somewhere else. And they did. Not one word of apology to the church. What was that? That was an evil guy uh, that... I don't know if he was a novice, but whatever he was, he wasn't uh, obeying the word of God, having a good report of them that were th without. Why, those poor ladies at the bar thought he was a Texas Ranger, lying to people. And I could go on about that story, but I mean, just can you imagine a person that claims to be a pastor preaching the gospel on Sunday morning while he's at a bar Saturday night, lying to girls, telling them he's a Texas Ranger and trying to pick them up? That's sick. That's sick. So pastor shouldn't be that. Well, verse 8, likewise must the deacons. So likewise for the deacons means everything that's up here, the deacon should be like. So likewise, your deacon should be like this. And we see here a list of what the deacons should be like. They should be grave. What does grave mean? It means serious. They should be serious. Now, that doesn't mean you can't joke around from time to time, but you should be very serious about the things of God. In other words, you believe what you're preaching. They should not be double-tongued, not given to much wine. It says here, uh, not greedy. So some of the exact same things that Paul is saying to, to the pastors... He's also saying to the deacons. So verse 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Then verse 9 says, Holding the mystery of the faith in pure conscience. So God says they're supposed to hold something. Holding a mystery. Hmm, what could that mystery be that the Apostle Paul says that they should hold? Now I think when he says holding the mystery, he's talking about both pastors and deacons. Because that has to do with preaching. And sometimes deacons can preach. Sometimes a pastor might be sick. 
Or he might be invited out of town to preach in a different church. Who's going to preach in his place? That should be the deacons. The deacons should know the Word of God so well that they can always fill in and preach for the pastor if need be. And it says here, holding the mystery of the faith in pure conscience. Let's look at a couple places about the mystery. God revealed some mysteries under the Apostle Paul when God revealed doctrine to him. What are these mysteries? Well, there's seven of them, but I'm not going to go into all seven. I'm going to go into a main one here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 through 9. Talk about the mystery. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of the world, nor of the princes of the world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. What does it have to do with? Verse 8, Christ crucified. It's the gospel. See, the gospel of Paul was revealed to Paul. It was a mystery back here. And until the Jews actually rejected their Messiah as a whole, that's when Jesus revealed to Paul the mysteries that are for the Gentiles and for the church age for today. What could he be speaking about as the mystery? Well, I think it ties into salvation. Salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself. Um, chapter 3 of Ephesians. Chapter 3, 3 and 4. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Who made known unto who? God made known unto Paul the mystery. Of what? Verse 2, the grace of God. As I wrote before in few words, verse 4, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So there was a mystery that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. What is this mystery? To find out what the mystery is, we go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, actually, let's start in verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery. So what is the mystery? It was the grace of God dispensed to Paul to tell Paul, go tell everyone you're saved by grace through faith and not of works. And it says here, even the mystery which has been hid from ages, from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Now, what was it manifest in the saints? This all ties in with the mystery. What is the mystery? Verse 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this mystery that Paul was preaching is that when you get saved, you become a part of the body of Christ. You are now in Christ. You are in His body. And now you have Christ in you. So when you're saved, you get Christ in you in the form of the Holy Spirit. And when you get saved, you get baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. So in Christ is a term that Paul uses over and over again. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And by in Christ, he means by in the body of Christ. So when we preach the gospel and someone believes it and gets saved, guess what has happened? Somebody else got into the body of Christ, the church. That's a blessing. That's an amazing statement there. So, quickly here, he goes back to verse 8. Likewise, the deacons must be this, this, and this. Verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Verse 10, and let these also be first proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So they need to preach them the mystery. They also need to be blameless. And they need to be proved. That means they need to be showing others that they're already doing that, preaching the gospel. And if they're doing what they're supposed to do in preaching the gospel and trying to tell others how to get saved and showing good works toward others by ministering to, like in the case of Acts, the widows, by feeding widows, then they've proved themselves, and eventually a deacon can become a pastor. And then it says here in verse 11, So, even so, must their wives be. So not only does the Bible tell us that what a deacon should be, God says, now the wife of the deacon should be like this too. What should she be like? Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers. What's a slanderer? Someone going around talking about others, accusing them of things that aren't true, slandering their good name, lying about them. 
must be grave, not slanderer, sober, faithful in all things. Verse 12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon, well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, that's not saying that you pay money to become a deacon. It says they have purchased to themselves. And what it's saying is that if you desire the office of a deacon and you're made a deacon, you are purchasing by what good you do rewards in heaven. Because the more you do as a Christian for Jesus, the more he'll give you in heaven. And you're purchasing by your own sacrifice for serving God rewards and glory. And I believe that's what it's talking about there. Purchasing to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, these things write unto, you, unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Verse 15, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now some people say, see, see, this is a church building. It's a pillar. It's a house. Well, remember, during this time they were meeting in houses. So it's not talking about a building. <laughs> it is not saying that the church is a building. The church are the people. If you tarry long, thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave, behave, behave thyself in the house of God. What's that? When people come together and they meet in a house, they should behave a certain way in that which is the church of the living God. What is that? The church is the people. The pillar and ground of the truth. So the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. That's what the world gets the truth from today, is from the church. Save people. And a local church's job is to work together to go out to try to get people saved. Now verse 16. This will be our last verse here. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. I usually try to close all my sermons with, you know, the Gospel. <laughs> and here it is. The Gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. What is it? That Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Well, here's the Gospel. It says that He was justified in the Spirit, manifest in the flesh, so He was born, Justified in the Spirit, seed of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed in the world, received up the glory. That sounds a lot like death, burial, resurrection of salvation and justification, salvation by faith. So there's the gospel there for you. But notice though it says, God was manifest in the flesh. All new versions of the Bible take out the word God and put He in its place. So all new versions in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 change, they change the word God to He. Now this is one of the greatest verses in the entire Bible about the deity of Jesus Christ. That is, proving that Jesus Christ is God. Now let's read it with that change, the way the new versions do. And without controversy, great is the mystery of Godliness, He was manifest in the flesh. He who? Who was manifest in the flesh? Without a King James Bible, you don't know who was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, and received up into glory. You have no idea. Just he, some guy named he. Now why is that? I've got a note here that in Bible school they told me that there were 250 manuscripts in Greek that have the word God, and only four manuscripts that have the word he. I don't know if that's true or not. I know there's the Textus Receptus. The Greek Textus Receptus is the majority text. There's over 5,000 texts. And many of those texts say God. Now, this is what they did. Now, you tell me if it should be God or if it should be He. In the Greek language, and I'll do this as quickly as I can, the word for God is Theos. Actually, the E is more like that. You notice how it's a circle with a line through it? That's the word for God. Theos means God. Now, many of the old manuscripts, they wrote in all capitals, and they would abbreviate words sometimes. So the abbreviation in all capitals of this word, Theos, is, is like this. With the line through it. So that's the way that many manuscripts wrote God in 1 Timothy 3.16. 
Now, the word for he is huias, or, or hos. And that, in all capitals, is this. Without the line through it. And usually it takes an accent on the top for a for a we I think it takes the accent for the H sound, if I remember correctly. Now, you go to all the majority manuscripts of the Bible. The majority of all the Greek manuscripts have this right here, which is God. You go to Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, you go to those corrupt Catholic manuscripts, and you know what you see? You'll see it says this, He. And so they say, well, it ought to say He was manifest in the flesh, it ought to say He. Well, if you take those old, corrupt manuscripts, and you look closely, you can clearly see that at one time there was a line there, just like this, and that it said God. But someone came along, and they erased that line. Somebody changed God to He. Who would do that? When the Bible says God was manifest in the flesh, that clearly proves that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Now, someone who doesn't like that, let's see, who would not like that? Oh, Satan! Satan hates that Jesus Christ is God. I wonder if some guy that was a, a closet Satanist occultist didn't go, Oh no, it says God will manifest in the flesh. Oh no, oh no. And the demons inside of him didn't say, Erase it, erase it. And he went, Ooh, erase the line. So it would change it to he. But the King James Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. And the manuscript evidence proves that the word God is correct. The line was there in many, many manuscripts. And the ones that don't have it, scholars say, well, it should be he, because when well, you look at that, and, and in a couple of those, the line was there, but someone erased it. And a scholar came later and wrote it with just a circle without the line. So clearly the King James Bible is superior to all other Bibles in English, because all other Bibles, except possibly the New King James, I don't have one of those, you could check that yourself, but I'm pretty sure the New King James changes this as well, changes God to He, and attacks the deity of Jesus Christ. Now I wanted to give you some verses on Jesus being God. I guess I don't have time. I'll just give those to you, if you need them, you can write them down quickly. Matthew 123, in Matthew chapter 120, in verse 23, Jesus Christ is called Emmanuel, which interpreted is God with us. So Jesus is God. Acts 20, 28. He talks about God who purchased with his own blood the church. Well, if Jesus shed his blood, then who is Jesus? God. And God, Jesus, purchased the church with his own blood. 1 John 5, 20 says this is God, Jesus Christ, in context. The Old Testament is in Isaiah 54, 21. Jehovah says, I am Savior, besides me there is none else. You go to Titus 2.13, it tells us that Jesus Christ is the Savior. So without a doubt, the same Savior in the Old Testament is the same Savior in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is God, He's part of the Trinity. He is one God with three parts, and part of it is God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, God the Son. So don't allow anybody to lie to you. The Jehovah Witnesses are out there going around saying, no, Jesus isn't God, Jesus isn't a God. And you look at their version of the Bible, they chose He. Because they don't want you to believe that Jesus Christ is God. They have a corrupt version. A couple more verses, 1 Timothy 2, 3, 1 Timothy 4, 10, and 2 Timothy 1, 10. Show that Jesus is God, and Jesus is the Savior. So Jesus Christ is God, manifest in the flesh. So I appreciate you watching this. Um, I was blessed with new lights here lately. So hopefully my videos will get better light and be a more of a blessing to you, and hopefully you can see things better. But I appreciate you watching. Let me get out of your way. And I hope this is a blessing to you as we looked at the qualifications of a pastor and a deacon. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. God bless.